Welcome, everybody, to tonight's public engagement session. We are very thankful that you were able to join us tonight. I'm Zach Spicer, and I'm here with my colleagues Robert Williams and Jack Amendolia. And tonight we are going to walk you through some of the context and background to the ward boundary review. And we'll be introducing some preliminary ward boundary options for you tonight. So what will we what will be covered in tonight's information session? Well, first we're going to go through the legislative framework and the review process. We're going to discuss why a ward boundary review was necessary for Clarendon at this time, and we'll present some of the findings from our discussion paper and what we heard during the first phase of the ward boundary review. And then finally, we will um, wrap up tonight with some preliminary ward boundary options, and this is where. We are looking forward to hearing your feedback um, as we proceed through the next phase of this review project. So first, a little bit of context. The town of Newcastle was created from a merger of the former town of Bowmanville, the village of Newcastle, and the townships of both Clark and Darlington in 1973. In 1993, the town of Newcastle was renamed Clarington, and at this time, Council included six, uh, six councillors, three regional and three local, uh, and one mayor who was elected at large. So, so this, this created three local wards. In 1996, this was changed. Still, still included six, six councillors, but they had two regional councillors and four local councillors elected from one ward each. Since this time, the ward structure in Clarington has remained untouched. So this is... Um, one of the reasons why it's it's good to have a, a uh, ward boundary review at this time, given that a regular review of processes and policies in, within um, government is, is um, healthy. So um, let's look a bit here at the legislative framework. Uh, under the Municipal Act, Clarington has the ability to change the size of its council, Term, determine how council is going to be elected, uh, with the exception of the mayor, of course, and divide or redivide the municipality into wards or dissolve the existing wards. So, with that said, there is le legislative permission for the town for the municipality of Clarington to engage in this process. But with that said, um, there isn't any sort of stipulated schedule or standardized process available in the act, which stipulates how this has to happen. But um, but with that said, we do have um, a number of guiding parameters and principles that help us along this route, including uh, a number of, di of um, different judicial decisions, including um, a range of decisions coming from LPAT and its predecessor, its predecessor, the Ontario Municipal Board. These help us um, guide some of our uh, work throughout this process. So, as I mentioned right now, we are in phase two of the, of the review. Phase one included a lot of information gathering uh, about, um, about Clarendon and its awards, some of, the, some of which we will discuss later in, in, the, um, in the, the presentation tonight. Um, but what we're going to be talking about tonight is, uh, is phase two. So we're going to introduce some of the preliminary ward boundary options, introduce some of the, uh, the population forecasting and data modeling. Um, but we want to get your thoughts on some of these preliminary ward boundary options. So we're here at step three in uh, the, the second phase of this review. At this point, I will turn things over to my colleague, Robert. Thank you, Zach. Now let's be clear what this review is about. The primary purpose is to provide advice to Clarington Council. They have the, the power to make these decisions and that would involve, first of all, maintaining the existing ward structure, that is to do nothing or to adopt an alternative arrangement. So our goal is to provide them with advice through uh, a final report, which spells out the reasons why they should be doing that. Uh, and what kinds of things they should be taking into account in reaching either decision. Now, we start with the uh, a fact that Clarington's representation on Durham Council and Regional Council is set at three members. That is a mayor who's elected at large and the two regional councillors. Uh, that will not change. So three members of the seven members of Clarington Council are outside of the control of council. As we've noted, uh, Clarington is divided into four wards. Each of those elects one of those regional councillors. 
uh, but the two regional councillors are elected in a pair of wards. Wards one and two elect a regional councillor. Wards three and four elect another regional councillor. This arrangement of, of four wards, uh, four local councillors, two regional councillors, has been in place since 1996, when the population of Clarington was less than 65,000 people. Today, it's approaching 100,000 people. And again, as, as Zach suggested earlier, it's time to step back and really say, is this the right structure to use? Is this the right uh, rep model of representation? So our questions involve looking at whether the present electoral structure serves the citizens of Clarington well. Do they have a, a good system to capture all the interests and perspectives of the community in this forward model? And do, does that present electoral structure provide fair and effective representation? Two somewhat different concepts. Fair representation is, is as it sounds. Do I get a fair shake in determining the composition of council? Am I at an advantage or disadvantage compared to other people uh, in Clarington? And do I have a chance to be heard by my counselor and, and to stay in touch with, uh, to, for that counselor to stay in touch with me in our system? Effective representation is really about that ongoing relationship. So that would lead us to a question to say whether an alternative system would in fact improve on those conditions. So we look at the current system to make those evaluations. And then if we find there's a shortfall, we would look at some other alternatives. Now, the present ward system, as we said, has been in place since 1996. It is an unusual one uh, in that, that three of the wards are, are kind of in a ribbon shape, if you will. They run from Lake Ontario all the way up to the northern boundary of Clarington. And the fourth ward is really the continuation of, of the previous township of Clark, uh, which is a different look, and that includes uh, Newcastle and Orono. That's the system that we're looking at. We start with saying, uh, does that still work? And one of the starting points, of course, is the population of those wards. And this uh, slide shows us that uh, the population of Ward 1 uh, is, is fairly high. It's almost uh, matched by Ward 2. But when we shift over to Wards 3 and 4, the, the population drops considerably. So there is an imbalance. Uh, uh, in the ward, in the four wards, they are not all of equal uh, population. Their size is another matter, but they're not of equal population, and that would be the starting point for a discussion uh, about about um, whether this is still the right way to do it. There are also a couple of other issues that, it, while we're doing this review, that we need to ask about: Is it still appropriate to have four local councillors? in a municipality that will soon have a population over 100,000 people. It was the model used when it was 65,000. Is, is the idea of four councillors and therefore four wards still appropriate when the population is much, much larger as, and is expected to continue to grow? And of course, the other part is, is, of this is that uh, Clarington's councillors are part-time. Granted, uh, three of them, are also a, a part of the regional council, but they're all considered part-time councillors for a municipality of 100,000 people. And we need to just basically step back again and say, is this the right way to provide effective political management and representation in a very diverse municipality while still remaining, and the favorite phrase is, close to the people, municipalities, a municipal level is the, the level closest to the people, is seven people enough, and in particular are four wards enough to provide that kind of connection. Having uh, looked at those questions, we also need to know whether there's anything in the current system that is thought to be desirable. Is it, is it, does it have its strengths? The weaknesses we've touched on already a little bit, uh, the shape of, of three of them is, is perhaps a weakness uh, because they do blend uh, both urban areas and rural areas, but also the imbalance of population. So some of the weaknesses are there, but there may also be some strength, strengths 
that we need to know about. Thanks, Bob. Um, so uh, what, the, what did we do during the first uh, phase? Well, um, we uh, took, it, took it upon ourselves to engage in a number of different public engagement activities. The first that uh, we interviewed senior staff and most of the members of council. Here we are lo looking for their opinion and feedback on, on how the current ward system works. And we're looking to hear more about the different communities within Clarington itself. We had four one hour public consul consultation sessions, very similar to what you are seeing tonight, where we had a, a presentation and then um, time allotted for uh, feedback about the current ward system. And we had a survey and engagement website where uh, comments were collected from those who were interested in providing them. Now, we've taken all of that feedback very, very seriously. And uh, I'm going, going to present some of those uh, findings, but the, the one high level finding that was re was repeated several times is that respondents within Clarington tended to um, identify more with their individual communities than with Clarington as a whole. So if you were from Bowmanville, you tended to identify uh, with uh, Bowmanville primarily um, as as opposed to um, Clarington as a whole. And some of the other findings here. The first is that um, there are strong rural and ag agricultural interests um, across Clarington. The majority of Clarington's geography is primarily rural and primarily agricultural. With that said, the bulk of the population is within the southern area of the municipality. Um, as Bob noted, um, the current uh, wards, of course, run north-south. Um, uh, starting at Lake Ontario and ending at the northern boundary of Clarington. Um, this makes sure that there's not a specific um, agricultural or rural interests that um, are represented on council. The second finding is that respondents tended to, to believe that um, Clarington's uh, regional councillors should continue to be attached to the wards. Uh, in some municipalities across the province, uh, regional councillors are elected at large. We heard that having them attached to individual wards works well, and that um, that there is um, a component that assists with uh, with constituency work here as well. So actually lightens the load of some of the local councillors. So we we have heard that there is a benefit to continuing with that practice. Third is that um, some people thought that adding additional uh, voices to, to the council table would be beneficial and contribute to the ongoing democratic needs of Clarington, um, which, which we'll uh, touch on um, again in a second. And then uh, fourth, response, respondents suggested that, um, that priority be placed upon the principles of representation by population and effective representation and slightly less on community or diversity of interest. And then finally, um, a number of people in the survey and uh, some, some staff members addressed the possibility of uh, a five or six ward system that would add one or two more local councillors to um, Clarence Council. This complements some of the calls that we've, um, that, we, that we've had for a northern ward, given that um, we have heard that there are strong rural interests that are simply not represented right now on council, given that the current ward systems blend rural and urban populations together. With that, I'll turn it back to uh, Bob. Thank you, Zach. Now, the starting point, of course, is to say you've got a ward system. Is it still workable? And so we want to assess that uh, uh, structure, the present words, to determine whether, and I've used this phrase earlier, it constitutes an equitable, that is a fair and effective electoral arrangement. Does it provide effective representation to the residents of the municipality? That becomes a, a part of the paper that, that is uh, currently uh, available. And if there are shortcomings, then we would look at ways to improve it. Are there other alternatives that we could con, uh, consider uh, that would attack uh, the particular shortcomings? Now, our preliminary assessment, and we've developed this in more detail, uh, suggests that the present wards do fail to adhere to the representation, representation by population principle. We saw that slide earlier. The difference between the largest and the smallest wards 
is really quite uh, significant. And that moreover, when we look toward the future, which is part of our, our responsibility here, the population disparity actually gets worse through the next three elect election cycles. We, it, in other words, the population growth does not correct the imbalance that's there. And we saw the chart earlier, or the, the graph earlier, but here is another way of representing that. Our goal in here is to, to achieve what we call an optimal size for a ward. If there are four wards and the population in 2016, the last, the last census was 92,000, then a ward, each of the four wards should be about 23,000 people with a bit of, of flexibility. And we can see from this that even with a 25% variation, Ward 4 does not even uh, reach that height, and Ward 1 is well above that. When we move out uh, to the current situation in, in, in uh, 2020, we see that the Ward 1 is right at the very top of the range of variation, and Ward 2 is now well beyond it. Ward 4 is, is even less uh, likely to meet that. So uh, in, in both in the 2016 picture and, and in 2020, two of the four wards do not meet the population parity principle. So uh, those two points are, are clear, but there are other comments that, that come out uh, in looking at the way the wards are currently structured. There are three major settlement areas uh, in Clarington, Curtis, Bowenville, Newcastle, and those three communities are in separate wards. In other words, no ward is has both Curtis and Bowmanville or Bowmanville and Newcastle, there are separate. Uh, but in that process, the northern hamlets seem to ha that seem to have more in common with one another are attached to these southern communities so that, that those separate interests are not recognized while the urban ones are. Another small part, uh, Bowmanville is divided into two wards. Yes, the population is large, but as a community, Bowmanville has two voices uh, and, and not necessarily uh, uh, the way that, that we would think is appropriate uh, in the present day. It may have been back in 1996. It probably isn't now. Now, the good side is the boundaries are pretty straightforward. They follow major roadways. They're easy to see and easy to understand if you think about it. Yes, I've crossed from one ward to another, and I know not a lot of people think about about their daily life that way, but that that's an advantage. The boundaries are easy. The other downside, though, is that rural Clarington, and we heard uh, at a number of levels that rural Clarington is a, a very clear community of interest. It's scattered across the four wards. There is no voice, if you will, no single voice for rural Clarington. So um, we get the, to the issue here about effective representation. And the overarching principle of effective representation means that each resident should have comparable access to their elected representative, and that each local councillor should speak on behalf of an equal number of residents. And what we mean by that is that if one councillor is representing a disproportionate amount of, of, of constituents, that places a, a larger burden on them in terms of, of constituency work and service, and that it dilutes the voice of those residents on council. The current population disparities between awards right now, right now in Clarington are too great to achieve effective representation. So that brings us to the question, do the wards need to be changed? In, in our estimation, yes. Um, the wards do not provide for effective representation based upon the core principles that we uh, that, that have been established for this particular review. Um, we should note here, of course, though, that the no ward system can, can uniformly meet all of the core principles at the, uh, at the same time. That it's that this is a, a process where you're potentially trading off between different principles. Clarington presents a fairly unique challenge in this respect, given that most of the geography uh, is rural, um, but most of the population is based within um, within the south, and most of that population is is really centered um, in and around Bowmanville. So uh, maintaining 
communities of interest and achieving population parity between the wards is a very tall task. But what we are going to show you tonight are some some examples um, that, that 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 work to achieve balance between some of these uh, different principles. So while we know that it's difficult to meet all of the principles, our starting point has to be which ones do we make the priority? And we did ask uh, residents in the first round to give us some uh, assessment of what goals we should be seeking. What are the things should, that should be the biggest priority uh, in, in divide, designing an alternative system? And as you can see from this chart, uh, representation by population was endorsed by uh, the largest proportion. These were, we asked people to give us their two top preferences. So these numbers don't add up to 100. So don't expect that to be the case. But out of the priority, out of the alternatives, the principles rather, which were the priorities, the two related to population and representation uh, were the most significant. But community of interest was a very significant component. So what we want to do in looking for alternative ways to represent, to create representation on council is to work with those principles in designing various alternatives. Now, as Zach mentioned a moment ago, we have some particular challenges in Clarington. Uh, there are several historically recognized population centers, but they're in varying sizes. Uh, the, the northern hamlets are a much different size than Bowmanville. Bowmanville is a different size than Newcastle, although that's growing. We've got to try to figure out a way to recognize those population centers. That's part of that point about community of interest. Uh, we're also working with the concentration of population, close to 75% of it in the, in the two southern centers of Curtis and Bowmanville. So how do we, how do we create a ward system uh, with only four parts when three quarters of it is in two parts of the municipality. In, in addition, of course, this large, thinly populated northern territory that uh, uh, we've referred to uh, already. And then finally, the, the significant population growth that is expected to happen in the southern part. So this 75% is probably going to be even more extreme over the next 10 years. And so F trying to fit that together in a four ward system is uh, this the challenge that we face, no matter which principles we put at the top of the list, trying to, to uh, organize four wards to meet the principles with those conditions is very difficult. And the, the, the point that we need to come back to, of course, is that those characteristics are not going to change. Uh, uh, the Cl Clarington will look like they, that way. What can change is the number of wards. And so what we've looked at is starting with four wards, let's see if they can work. And we provide two preliminary four ward options. One that puts an emphasis on population distribution, preliminary option A, and preliminary option B that, that reflects the distinctive communities of interest, but results in population disparities. Again, You've got to trade off those two major themes. Preliminary option C uh, is, is a five ward option, which adds a rural ward north of Curtis and Bowmanville. And you'll see that in a few moments in these examples. But option D includes two largely rural wards uh, to keep the number, uh, to, to put the number at, at six in the, um, in, in the a future council. So um, the next steps uh, from here. So um, the interim report um, is um, uh, ha has been submitted to um, council um, and the round two public uh, consultation sessions are going to help us um, provide an opportunity for us to better understand Clarington. We uh, still want to hear your, your uh, feedback. And it'll, be a, a, it'll also provide an understanding of the preferences of members of the uh, of the public um, as to how they want to uh, to proceed with um, with a uh, ward system and to get their feedback on um, the, the the different um, ward options. And finally, we are going to um, uh, develop uh, different uh, recommended ward options to um, to to include in our in our final report. 
So, um, your contribution. Um, first tonight, um, be willing to ask questions and um, let us know what you think of the preliminary ward options that we're going to show you tonight. Um, also, be sure to uh, check out the Engage Clarington website. Um, there's lots of information there on the review itself and um, and should uh, should be helpful to you in in providing further background context at uh, this particular review. Um, read the interim reports and our discussion paper. Um, and of course, um, continue to complete the survey um, that's on the municipality's website. So uh, we want public input. We want people to help us understand what they believe is appropriate for Clarington, for a, a future composition of council, for a future set of wards. And that is an important part of what we want to do here. And so we want your input to provide that kind of insight. But we also need to emphasize that this is not a popularity contest. This is not a matter of whoever puts up their hand to vote for uh, option whatever, whatever is going to be the right one. It's part of the insight we need to gather from the community to be able to use in relationship with the expertise that we're bringing to this and the experience that we find in other municipalities to, de to develop our recommended options. Your input is important, but it's not, it's not going to be the, the only story but certainly uh, we would like you to give us some thoughts and in particular to explain why you like one option rather than another or why you think an option uh, that uh, some changes to that option would be helpful. Those are all perspectives that we find most valuable. So let's now turn to some of these uh, to the to the preliminary options and uh, we can take your questions about them and about what we've talked about so far.